the president of Sher Shemayim, Mr. Brian Lass. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wagner, or is it Charles Wagner or Chuck Wagner? I'm not really sure. I've known you so long. Uh, I'm not the president. I, uh, I uh, finished my presidency a couple days ago, so I'm now the past president, and uh, I want to welcome everyone here today on behalf of uh, the shul, on behalf of the president, Benny Osher. And past presidents are like uh, old politicians. No one wants to hear from us not at home and not here at shul, so Chuck, uh, please get your next person up here. Welcome everyone, thank you. We scheduled Mr. Last to speak for 10 minutes. So since I have some time, so, since I have some extra time, I'd like to speak for a moment about one of the, uh, the, back, the background of why many of us are here today. Uh, it's Jewish continuity. Uh, there's no more important an issue to the Jewish con uh, community the worldwide Jewish community than continuity. In the material you have before you, both in your binder and in the flash drive, you'll see numerous articles that talk about how almost 70% uh, uh, of the non-Orthodox community amongst Jews intermarry and assimilate. You'll see that the studies in North America project that in 70 years, that segment of the community may be down as much as 90%. Uh, today's seminar is not about whether uh, um, Jewish continuity is good or bad, though. It's about the legality of including in your will a disinheritance clause. I, I ask the audience as uh, the different advocates advocate for one position or another to remember um, even if the uh, even if someone is advocating that the clause is illegal they're not advocating that, uh, against Jewish continuity. And I'd like to speak for a moment about the event itself. First of all, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Charles. The reason Brian was confused is when I was in high school, I was known as Chuck. When I became a lawyer, my principal asked me, what's your name? So I said, my name is Chuck. He said, wrong. I said, what's your real name? Charles. So I've had this schizophrenic type uh, uh, identity crisis since I started practicing law. But whatever you're comfortable with, I answer to both names. I'd like to do a quick thank you to our sponsors. First, uh, to the Bank of Nova Scotia Trust Company, uh, the Scotia Private Client Group. I'm a big believer in corporate trustees in general, and uh, the Bank of Nova Scotia Tr Company in particular. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, having dealt in many difficult cases with Teresa and uh, John, uh, their advice is always wonderful. Uh, if you're involved with them, don't hesitate to ask them. They have tremendous experience, which they're more than happy to pass on. And they've been a big supporter of these events, so I wanted to say thank you. Before I leave the bank, I wanted to tell you that there was a gentleman who's no longer with us, his name is Dave Johnson, who was also uh, a good friend uh, of B'nai B'rith and uh, an, excellent, an excellent person at the Bank of Nova Scotia. Um, Cher Shemayim, uh, Brian has been very supportive 
as has the executive and as the uh, uh, congregation here inviting us back as second year. We very much appreciate them. And I'd also like to speak for a moment about B'nai B'rith, the sponsor of this event, and in particular, Frank Diamond. Uh, Frank, everybody knows Frank. He's the executive director. He is a, in my mind, a, a hero of the Jewish people. Uh, he's a wonderful person, and uh, I think everybody knows what he does. I just have a question for him. Frank, how often do you meet with the Prime Minister? Where are you? And finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank my co-chair, Anita Bromberg. Anita, where are you? Okay. Uh, everyone organizing a CLE event should have an Anita. She's unflappable. She keeps her head when there's tremendous stress. She's reliable. And when she says she's going to do something, she delivers. Now, you each have a binder with you. And in that binder, you'll see the application record. And you might want to take a few minutes to go through it because it sets out the requests that we're asking from Judge Jordy. It also sets out the grounds we're relying on in the affidavit of the disinherited beneficiary. Now, in your binder, there are selected cases that are relevant for today, selected articles uh, that address the legal issues, and there are selected articles that address the issue of continuity. But we really didn't have enough room in the binder. So what we did is we provided you with this handy dandy flash drive. All you have to do is twist it and uh, it'll allow you to access the information. There is a plethora of information that's worthwhile to go through. Mm -hmm. Articles on public policy, articles on whether Tatarin applies to Ontario, and articles about Jewish continuity. I'm not, nor is B'nai B'rith, nor any of the sponsors saying we agree with everything in the articles. You'll find that some of them are controversial, but it is worthwhile, if you are ever faced with this issue, to have access to that information. Let's talk about today's event. The format follows Rule 76.12, subsection 1, a summary trial. And when I say it follows it, it, it sort of follows it. Unlike a usual trial, the majority of the evidence is adduced by affidavit. And there are strict timelines imposed on the cross-examinations of the affidavit. It's 10 minutes. Each lawyer only has 10 minutes to cross-examine on the affidavit. Now, there are two cross-examinations going to be going on today. One will be uh, of the disinherited beneficiary, and the other will be the expert witness. The expert witness has not done an affidavit but he's done an expert report. Let's talk about the facts for a moment. Howard Shapiro was disinherited by his father because he married a non-Jewish girl. The role of Howard Shapiro is being played by Howard Black. Let me give you a few particulars about Howard Black. He's a professor of law at Osgoode Hall. He is both a solicitor and a litigator in estate matters. He's also a fine mediator. Now, in, if you turn to tab 4A, you will see Howard Shapiro's affidavit in support of his application. That's important because it's going to be on that uh, affidavit that he'll be cross-examined. He is seeking to set aside a provision in his father's will that disinherited him from marrying outside the faith. 
Let's talk about Mr. Schwartz's legal team. Excuse me, Mr. Shapiro's legal team. First, there's me. I am a partner at Wagner Sidlovsky. And I'll be arguing that the disinheritance clause is void because it offends public policy. The next member of Howard's legal team is Kim Whaley. Kim Whaley is the senior partner in Whaley Estate Litigation. She is also an estate litigator, also a fine mediator, and she'll be arguing that Ontario has adopted the law of British Columbia, which effectively allows the courts to vary wills that do not provide a person's children or spouse with a share of the estate. So far, there's no case in Ontario that says exactly that. It's close, but you'll hear Kim's argument. Archie Rabinowitz is the last member of the applicant's legal team. Archie, as many of you know, is a partner at Fraser Milner. He's an estate litigator. He's a mediator. And he will be cross-examining the star witness of those propounding the will. So when the will was challenged, who did John Clegg and Teresa Axe of the Bank of Nova Scotia Trust Company hire to represent them? Who did they hire to defend the disinheritance clause? By the way, in the States, and if, you know, if you've read through the material, I think it's called the Jew Clause. Well, their star witness was Rabbi Torchiner. Rabbi Torchiner is the Rosh Kollel of Yeshiva University in Toronto. He provided us with the expert report on Jewish continuity. As a regular attendee at one of his classes, I can personally attest to his eruditeness, his intellectual honesty, and his wisdom. He's the star witness who will speak about the importance of Jewish continuity to the Jewish population and also to Canada. So again, now we know who the star witness is. Who did John Clegg and Teresa Axe hire? Surprise, surprise, Ian Hull. Everybody knows Ian. He's a partner at Hull & Hull. Prolific author, litigator, mediator. And he will be arguing that the disinheritance clause has not offended public policy. He will be arguing that there is a positive element to this, and the positive element is Jewish continuity. And for that reason, it is not void for offending public policy. The next member of the Scotia Trust legal team is Kelly Charlebois. Kelly is a partner at Miller Thompson, and she will be arguing that Ontario has not adopted the law of British Columbia, and, uh, <clears throat> and it does not permit the variation of wills in a, this context. Were it to do so, it would be usurping the cherished principle of testamentary independence. Now, as part of this background, father had two children. One, the applicant married outside the Jewish faith and got disinherited. And if that clause is upheld, his sister will inherit everything. Can I just ha have an idea? Who bets that the sister opposed the brother so she could inherit everything? She's represented by Craig Vanderzee. And Craig, he's a partner at Torque and Mains. He's a litigator. He's a mediator. You know, I'm the only one in this group who's not a mediator. He represents the sister. And he will be cross-examining Howard on his affidavit. Last but not least is Judge Jordy. Jordy Ayton is a solicitor. He's a litigator. And again, unlike me, a mediator. He's an author and he's counsel to Hull and Hull. Now, for those of you who were here last year, you'll remember that Jordy was the judge last time. So let me explain why we picked Jordy to be the judge. Anytime I go against one of the juniors in Hull and Hull, 
and we're debating an issue of law, I know I'm in trouble when they say, well, I asked Jordy. Jordy says, I know right away that uh, I, have, I have a difficult road ahead of me. And uh, it's not a surprise that we all agree that Jordy should be the judge here today. Those who usually introduce speakers don't spend 30 seconds on it as I just did. They wax eloquently about them. Our schedule is so tight today that we just didn't have the time. And truth be told, it's unnecessary. Each of the participants today are held in the highest regard by their partners, their peers, and their clients. I think that's one of the main reasons we have such a full house here today. But what makes them also very special is the altruistic and genuine willingness of each of them to mentor and give back to the profession. I have heard all of them at different times and places speak to me about their mentors. Rodney Hull, Wolf Goodman, Brian Schnur, and they've always spoken about them with fondness, gratitude, and respect. And they did so because each of those people I mentioned gratuitously gave of their experience and time, and they did so with grace. And so too do these presenters. So I say to my friends and my mentors, thank you for participating again this year. And we will begin as soon as I take my place at the applicant's table. Thank you. Mr. Rubinowitz, I think you're going to lead off. Uh, you, uh, we've, I understand that council have uh, consented to the uh, admission of the expert's report, and uh, I think uh, we'll begin with uh, your cross-examination. Morning, Rabbi. Uh, Mr. Rabinowitz, I believe um, the expert report is found at uh, tab 4C of the material. Is that correct? The alleged expert's report, yes. <laughs> oh, okay, Mr. Rabinowitz. <laughs> I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. May it, cle uh, may it please the court, uh, my lord, <laughs> Rabbi uh, Torchiner, learned counsel, Mr. Mr. Shapiro, my poor client. Rabbi, um, I, <laughs> I have uh, reviewed uh, your impressive resume, and I don't intend to spend any time uh, dealing with your uh, undisputed credentials. Well, that's uh, a relief. But <laughs> I, I take it that you would agree with me, sir, that uh, you have no formal training in the legal analysis of public policy or constitutional issues uh, involving the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. That's correct. Fair statement. Um, I take it then um, your report cites the importance of uh, preserving cultural minorities in order to promote multiculturalism. Is that a fair statement as well? Yes. The um, the question that I want to ask you is uh, a hypothetical question, uh, not found in our fact situation uh, today. But say that my client had uh, married a Jewish person, uh, someone indisputably of, Jew of the Jewish faith, 
And um, I take it that you would agree under that very simple scenario, uh, your understanding, and I'm not asking you from a legal perspective, but your understanding uh, in your capacity, I suppose, as an expert witness, that my client would in fact then be entitled to a share of the residue of his late father's estate. Uh, if he was married uh, to a Jewish person on the date of his late father's death. Is there a clause to the contrary in the will? I'm not sure what you're asking. Well, I take it you've looked at Article 3.4 of the last will and testament yes. in question. So, so you're asking, within, okay, within the context of this will, absolutely yes. Yes, okay. okay. The question that I have is, what if my client's Jewish wife came from a famous Hasidic family, but sadly, and heaven forbid, had fallen off the track, so to speak, in terms of Jewish observance, and was someone who ate cheeseburgers on Yom Kippur, never attended synagogue, did not observe the Sabbath, Surely in such a scenario, you wouldn't think that that person would be someone likely to be preserving the Jewish cultural minority in the way that you discuss in your report. Uh, since my understanding of the validity of the clause, and it's my understanding, uh, is predicated on Canada's Multiculturalism Act, which doesn't distinguish between you know, one member of ethnicity and another one and what they do with their ethnicity and how they live up to it, I would presume it would still be just as valid. And that person is less likely to, that hypothetical wife, we'll call her the Yom Kippur cheeseburger wife or spouse, uh, wouldn't be in a position in your estimation if you had to predict. Of course, the Talmud, as you cite in your report, tells us we can never know and predict what offspring mm -hmm. we might generate and what they might do and what great things they might achieve. But you would think that uh, such a person wouldn't be the likely candidate to be promoting uh, Jewish cont continuity in the sense that you would like to see it. Right, but it's not germane to the clause or to the will. Right. Yeah. So, um, you would agree with me, of course, that if the will provided that my client couldn't inherit if he was married to a different racial minority, you would agree with me in that situation, that's not something that would be consistent with promoting Jewish continuity. Right and it would offend even your notion of public policy. Yeah, absolutely. And um, your report agrees that racial discrimination would not be justifiable. Absolutely. But in your view, Rabbi, religious discrimination is acceptable, isn't it? Religious discrimination, no. Um, Support of Canadian public policy promoting diversity, yes. Uh, I, I would draw a line between that. Um, so as long as it could be rationalized by a notion of continuity of the Jewish community, then discrimination based on a religious designation would, in your view, be justifiable. I think that's what, that's what I've read of, of Canadian public policy, that discrimination which favors the whole by providing material benefit to a minority is considered good Canadian public policy. The promotion of diversity, the encouragement of minorities to um, continue to perpetuate their identity is considered to be good for Canada as a whole, and therefore, yes, uh, much as the service to Aboriginals and other examples I gave in my expert report. And if I change the 
fact situation one more time. So in contrast to the Jewish cheeseburger spouse that I gave you previously, if my client had been married to a Gentile who had converted to Judaism, but the conversion process was via a reform or conservative under the auspices of a reform or conservative rabbi. No ritual bath, no commitment to the observance of kashrut or the Sabbath uh, or the Torah commandments. And say that my client had been married to this Gentile woman for decades and she had changed over time just as the late Mark Shapiro had changed in his lifetime. You recall reading that in the affidavit, uh, describing the change in Mark Shapiro's lifestyle. So imagine this spouse had herself changed. And imagine that she became a Ba'alat Tshuva, so to speak, and became observant. Indeed, say she became more religious, spiritual, and observant than Janet Shapiro, or Janet Schwartz. Strictly kosher, observing all of the holidays, the Sabbath, insisting that her children attend fine Jewish schools, including Yeshiva University. In that case, you would still say, under your analysis, too bad, too sad. Unless the Orthodox arbiter concluded and determined that the standards for her conversion were acceptable by orthodox standards, she would not be considered a Jew. And in such a case, my client wouldn't inherit, would he? I mean, that's not within the parameters of my expert report. Um, I only touch on it briefly in terms of defining certain and saying that because it identifies a particular authority, that authority will apply his own standards. I think the rabbi of Shari Shemayim is identified and is a backup rabbi Herschel Schachter of Yeshiva University. So they're the ones who will determine what their standards are. Um, but uh, it's indeed possible that they'll decide that someone who has, a, has Jewish practices um, without what they view as Jewish conversion would not be Jewish. So in my scenario, the Jewish cheeseburger spouse scenario, my client would inherit, but in the scenario where he had been married to what was a Gentile who had converted, but not by Orthodox standards, and had become extremely Orthodox and observant, my client would not inherit. All right, so again, that's a possibility depending on the standards of the, the person who's supposed to be the arbiter. Right, keeping in mind that Canadian public policy is not particularly concerned with a person's level of religious observance. It's simply concerned with the continuity of the minority's existence. What the Canadian government cares about is the perpetuation of a minority that can claim that 43% uh, of, their, uh, of their membership, so to speak, have uh, advanced degrees, bachelor's degrees are higher compared to 16% of the population as a whole. They want a minority that's gonna bring its own particular flavor, its own unique element to Canadian life. They don't care about whether someone is religiously uh, observant or not. And um, thank you, Rabbi. Your, your view is that, and I quote from your report, actions to promote the marriage of Jews to other Jews are critical to the survival of the Jewish minority. You recall Correct. that yes. in your report. We see from the affidavit evidence that uh, Mr. and Mrs. Shapiro, as they were raising their children, they led a secular life, raised their children in a non-observant, non-religious <coughs> home. You recall seeing that? Yes. After Janet met and ultimately married her Orthodox husband, Abe Schwartz, that's when Mr. Mark Shapiro, the deceased, made the change in his life, made his home a kosher home, and I think according to the undisputed evidence in the affidavit material, attended prayers at synagogue on a daily basis. So we see that people can change, can't they? Yes. And sometimes, Rabbi, you'll agree with me that it's a change for the good, and sometimes, unfortunately, it might be a change for the bad. 
People change in all sorts of ways. The point Mr. is... Mr. Rabinowitz, sorry, are you almost uh, finished here? I am. I've been given a note okay. that I had three minutes left, but Thank you. if my Lord's watch is that's going fine. quickly, I'd be thrilled. That's, no, that, that's great. Maybe your last question here? <laughs> and, make it, and make it a good one. <laughs> if I may have a moment just to collect my notes and see if I have would, a good one left. Would you like a drum roll? I can arrange that. No, no, no. no okay. No. You'd agree with me that uh, my client, Howard Shapiro, he has the capacity to change. Certainly. He may be observant. He may be uh, spiritual. He may have a commitment to the continuity of the Jewish people, notwithstanding his uh, decision to marry in February of 2012. Certainly. I suggest to you, Rabbi, that cutting my client out in this way, do you not agree with me that it would cause resentment, anger, and it might actually minimize the chances of someone like my client ultimately working towards the goals of perpetuating Jewish values? I it's a little bit beyond the scope of my role as expert here, but I tend to agree with you that um, this is not exactly what I would prescribe as the way to preserve Jewish continuity. I think that it's perhaps, uh, aside from potentially being counterproductive, I think it's too little too late. Because you'll agree with me, Rabbi, and I think I'm paraphrasing your words, punishment is not a good way to promote the marriage of Jews to other Jews. If I didn't say it that way, I'm you know, glad to take those as my words. And indeed, Rabbi, I'll conclude with this by putting to you the proposition that presenting the benefit of a Jewish lifestyle speaks more powerfully than a financial carrot and a stick. Agreed. Those are my questions, my lord. Thank you. Uh, Rabbi, I just have one um, question. I read your report, and thank you very much. It was excellent. You uh, write about the Jewish theory that, um, that a, a son, you could sh uh, shift inheritance away from a son who, whose conduct demonstrate that his children will have no chance of receiving a Jew Jewish values. Um, is there any moral obligation on the parent to advise the child, in your view, of uh, the likely or the possibility of that disinheritance if they don't... Uh, follow that conduct? In other words, if I understand the question, what you're asking is, does a parent who plans to disinherit have to let the child know? Right, is there, would, would you say that there's any Jewish uh, moral obligation in that regard, or is that? I would tend to think so. We're warned not to put a stumbling block in front of the blind, and I think that if you leave someone in the dark about something that's going to so you know, materially affect their well-being, that would count. So yes, one would be obligated to notify. I think so. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Van Der Zee, I'm ready to hear from, uh, from you on your cross-examination of Mr. Shapiro. Mr. Shapiro, would you mind taking the stand, please? I believe Mr. Shapiro's uh, affidavit is found at tab uh, 4A of the material. I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Good morning, Mr. Shapiro. Morning, Mr. Vanderzee. Now, in support of your application, Mr. Shapiro, you have sworn an affidavit dated May 5th, 2012? That's correct. And that's the material that was just referred to by His Honor in the materials at the tab? That's correct. And when you swore that affidavit, it was your intent to be honest with the court? Absolutely. It wasn't your intent to mislead anybody. 
when you swore that affidavit as you knew it was going to be relied on from your perspective with respect to your alleged claims, correct? I did not intend to mislead anyone. It was the absolute truth. So you say. Um. <laughs> now hear, hear, Mr. Van Zee. <laughs> I take offense with that comment. Mr. Shapiro, I'll deal with that. Thank you. Mr. Van Der Zee, stick, stick to the script, please. <laughs> now, your father passed away on February 12th, 2012, correct? Yes, my dear so, father, yes. And so that was just several months ago? Yes. And you were able to commence this litigation within several months? By the way, I'm sorry, uh, Your Honor, Mr. Van Der Zee, just have to let you know that I have to go to Minion in a few hours from now, so I hope that this will be over, that I'll be able to go, go out, because I am saying Kaddish in my father's <laughs> memories. Are, are they paying you to be there? Um, are they paying you all. to be there? You're going on your own without Sorry getting paid? Sorry for that interruption, Your Honor. No, no problem. Now, now, Mr. Shapiro, you and your sister were raised to be proud of being... Sorry, uh, Mr. Shapiro, your keep has just fallen off. Do you mind just grabbing that? <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you're, you noticed, Your Honor, I, did, I am yes. wearing a keep. Yes. <laughs> It had to be dusted off, Your Honor. Um, <laughs> you and your sister, you and your sister were raised it's to be proud. It's great at covering the bald spot. <laughs> you should try it, Your Honor. <laughs> at some point, we're going to have an actual That's an question, objection. Your Honor. Um, you and your sister were raised to be proud of being both Canadian uh, and of your Jewish roots. Yes. And you went to synagogue and on high holidays, and you celebrated by um, having gatherings together at family meals. Yes, we did. And your Hebrew education continued up to the age of 13 years old. That's right. Uh, your father hired a tutor to teach you to read sufficient Hebrew so that you could chant the blessing, the appropriate blessing at your bar mitzvah. Yes. Fair to say that your father uh, wished to perpetuate and continue the Jewish faith and your involvement with the Jewish people as a child? I can't comment on what his intentions were and what his motivation was, but we had those experiences, yes. Well, sir, you indicated in your affidavit that when you got married to, to Miss O'Malley that you had the option of, uh, the option of converting, correct? She but, had the option of converting from uh, Catholicism to Judaism, and similarly, you had the option of converting from Judaism to Catholicism. I suppose that anyone has that option. And you didn't that do option. that, sir. You didn't do that, did you? I did not convert to Catholicism, and, your, and neither and in, did my wife convert to Judaism. And in, That's your affidavit, in your affidavit, sir, you go so far as to say, just as I would not give up Judaism to accommodate her. So notwithstanding that this was a person you were going to spend your entire life with, this was a person you loved, you weren't going to accommodate her by converting from one, your religion to another. Janet and I had had some uh, serious That's discussions. That's a yes or no answer, sir. I don't need the explanation. I, actually, you Mr. Did or Manazee, you didn't. can you let the witness uh, answer that, please? Thank you. Janet and I had had some serious discussions before we got married, and, and religion form part of those discussions and she and I both agreed that I would continue to practice my religion and I would not impose upon her the ability to continue practicing her religious belief should she choose to do so. And You made that decision on a personal vein sir because the continuation the preservation of your own faith in, in Judaism was that important to you. Yes that's right. So all those teachings and the uh, the steps that your father had taken when you were a youth continued on through you to the time when you decided to make one of the most important decisions in your life, uh, marrying an individual and then keeping your religion uh, in a personal regard. My commitment to the religion remained unchanged. Now, sir, you indicate that when you were just 17 years old, you were able to notice that in the year 2000, your father's uh, devoutness with respect to his belief in Judaism just simply increased. Yes. And that he made uh, the home kosher, he adopted some Orthodox Jewish practices, and he started to go to synagogue on a daily basis. That's correct. And that's correct? That's correct. And you believe that to be true? Yes, I do. And you respected his choice to do so? Yes, I did. And you would agree with me, sir, that the encouragement of and the preservation of the Jewish faith uh, and of the Jewish people is a noble goal? Yes, it's a noble goal. You don't want to see the Jewish faith disappear over, over many years? No, I wouldn't. And indeed, that would be something that you would consider uh, personally a disaster given your own views with respect to your own Jewish faith? I would be very upset if that were to occur, yes. Now, sir, the will treats, this is the, what we've loosely referred to as the, the, the subject clause, the disinheritance clause. The will treats you and your sister the same, correct? 
Well, subject to the discriminatory aspect of it, it treats us equally. Well, it, the wording is, applies equally to you and your sister, correct? Your understanding? You've read that, the will, haven't you, sir? Yes, I have. Yes, okay. that's my understanding, that and it would apply you, equally to us. And you certainly read the will before you did your affidavit? Yes, I did. So you're quite familiar then with the clause, right? Yes. So indeed, it doesn't treat your sister and you any differently, does it? No, it does not. And uh, the will was made in 2003, correct? That's right. You got engaged in 2011? Yes. That was eight years before you got engaged? Yes. Now, your father also um, was generous with you uh, throughout your lifetime? Yes, he was. He was generous to both me and my sister. Again, trying to, to, to look at it from the standpoint of just yourself. Um, you went to private school, summer camps, and were given the opportunity to travel by your dad? Yes. And you went to Columbia University in New York? Yes, he was very proud of that. And it was expensive to go there? Uh, it was fairly expensive, yes it was. You're not confused about that, are you? I don't believe so. Okay. Just Did my answer know. give you some reason to be confused? <laughs> you, you, you hesitated, you hesitated there, so I was just wondering. And, and your father wanted you simply to focus on your studies, correct? He was proud of those accomplishments and encouraged me to pursue those studies, yes. And indeed, he didn't want you to focus on having to make money while you were going to university or to have to pay for university, so he foot the whole bill, didn't he, sir? He supported my university education, yes. And you were happy that he did? Absolutely. I was very appreciative of it. And Mr. Van just a couple of more minutes, yeah. please. And after doing all of that, sir, <clears throat> your father also gave you $250,000 in seed money to start your own business, correct? Yes. There was no, uh, was there any issue with you receiving that amount of money? Did you say to your dad, listen, dad, I don't want to get handouts my entire life. I'll do this on my own. I'll take a loan if I need to. Did no, I was, that? I was very appreciative of the gift that he was granting to me. Now, in your affidavit, sir, and I'm getting to my last point, your honor. Uh, you. In your affidavit, sir, you indicate that, and this is in respect of paragraph 14 dealing with your decision and your wife's decision not to convert your religions. Uh, you said, we respect each other's right to believe what we believe and do not impose our customs on one another. Correct? That's correct. I've read it correctly. Those are your words? Yes. Now, that only applies as, as long as it doesn't apply to money, correct? So from your standpoint, it's fine for you to believe in your customs and not impose your customs on other as long as it doesn't have to do with the question of money, correct? I don't understand the question, Mr. Van. Well, sir, in this paragraph, I, I read the, the, the sentence correctly, I believe. I'll read it again in case, in case we didn't have a, a, an understanding on that. Paragraph 14, third line in, your words. We respect each other's right to believe what we believe and do not impose our customs on one another. That, yes. Those are your words, right? Yes. So as long as the issue isn't with money, you believe that to be true. But the only reason we're here today, sir, is because you're making a moral claim or a claim for your father's money. No, it's not, it's not correct at all, Mr. Vanderzee. Well, that phrase that you read in my affidavit related solely to respect, mutual respect for our respective religious beliefs. And in fact, my wife and I had a discussion that if we're fortunate enough to have children down the line, I'm going to instill in them practices of the Jewish faith, and if she chooses to instill in them and to have them experience practices of the Catholic faith, so be it. But my intention is to teach my children how to live Jewish lives. But again, sir, you're only affirming that uh, as it goes with respect to your religious beliefs, because this claim is all about money, sir. It's a matter of being treated equally. And my father was a firm believer but that's in... that's based on a moral claim, sir, correct? You're not alleging that... Well, you I'm not a lawyer, so I can't speak about legal claims. I'll leave that to my learned counsel to do so. Well, my father was a firm believer in the Charter of Rights that we have here in Canada and treating people without discrimination. I feel that by virtue of the clause in his will, he has discriminated against me. Okay, I just want to take you to a paragraph because I think you may have just forgotten this. You said, our father was not financially supporting anyone immediately before his death. Janet and I, Janet being your sister, are independent and self-sufficient. Each of us has a moral claim to share in our father's estate. So this is not a claim based on anything else than a moral claim. So your, your suggestion, sir, that you respect everyone's views only counts when it doesn't deal with money. Isn't that correct, sir? No, that's not correct. I believe that this is a moral claim, and I leave it to my lawyers who have advised me that there is a legal claim here as well. 
in swearing my affidavit, I can only speak to what I felt was my father's moral obligation. I'm not learned in the law. I don't know about what my legal rights are. That's why I've hired a very expensive team of lawyers there to represent me. They are actually very expensive. I'd like to see that bill at the end of the day. Those are my questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Just a hearty muzzle tough to you and Ms. O'Malley. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Hull, may I hear from you, please? Should I be turning up the factum? Uh, you can wait for my direction, thank you, Your Eminence. I'm going to be speaking to the audience, uh, because that is... Uh, what uh, I believe is the, uh, is the audience of the day today for me to concern myself with. I want to start with the relief sought. And I ask the, uh, the, the, the audience to consider, of course, the relief sought, which is set out of tab A of, ta uh, sorry, tab 4A. And the focus with, uh, with respect to this matter is, as has been identified uh, at the outset, uh, as to the whether or not the provision, the disinheritance clause of the will, which disinherits Howard Shapiro if he marries outside the Jewish faith, is unenforceable. And I think, as my dad taught me many years ago, we have to talk like lawyers. We cannot get caught up in what is an emotional and sometimes uh, non-legal driven uh, issue. And to do that, the courts have said two things. If a clause is enforceable, there are two steps to undertake. The first step, and the most important step, is to read the will. In the Sorry, will, I didn't catch that. <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't know you were here. Read... Manish to Nahalila Hazeh. See, there's a lot of stuff being said that's not fair, okay? You guys have to start talking slow in those things. What did you just say to me? <laughs> I'll translate. I'll tell you later. <laughs> All right. Uh, read the will. And the will is paramount in every matter of, 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 uh, of interpretation, which, although we want to characterize, and my friends will want to characterize at very high hourly rates, the emotional side of this debate, the debate comes down to what the courts can only do. We can only do so much. And again, as it's something my father taught me a long time ago, is that we don't have the right caller to fix all of the problems. And my friends are going to rely on a caller that they don't have either to sustain an argument that doesn't have any sustainability at law. So we look at the will. And to read the will, we, we look at just the first part of the clause. I bequeath all of the residue of my estate into two equal shares, one share to my son Howard and the other equal share to my son to my to Janet, provided that each child should receive his or her respective share of the bequest only if she is married at the time, or he or she is married at the time of my death to a Jewish spouse, goes on to define Jewish spouse, and it goes on to have an arbitration clause if the definition is getting uh, unwieldy. That is what the will says. There are two elements to that now. Is it a valid condition? A, Excuse me, I'm just being arrested here. Thank uh, you. It's long overdue. <laughs> Is it a valid condition, A, and B, is it void for public policy? Just one second, counsel. I just want to uh, read out a couple of license plates <laughs> that are parked uh, in, a, in the wrong spot. Okay, a this F isn't cutting into my time. No, no, don't worry. <laughs> AFLC704, is that a B? 672PS F. You've got to move your cars. Please. Thank you. Is that anyone here? You can sneak out the back. We won't look. <laughs> All right. Could I continue? Yeah, keep going. All right. I'm loving it so far. <laughs> Sorry, back here. Um, so 
the focus is the two-part analysis, and it is going to be the analysis in respect of any interpretation, which we are here to do today, and that is an interpretation of the clause. First, is it a, is it a lawful condition? Second of all, is it against public policy? The first element is, as I say, we look at the clause, and the case law says clearly that when we look at that clause, we determine whether or not it's a valid condition on a very principled basis. The first being which is, is that does the condition actually give a gift? Is there a gift that occurs? And that is almost always achieved with good drafting, and in this scenario we have good drafting. So then the question remains, if it's a valid gift that is actually fulfilled, in order for the beneficiary to receive that gift, that is, to, they, must marry out of the, they must not marry out of the Jewish faith, the defined term and what, what all the materials refer to as, quote, the Jewish clause, does that clause, um, does that condition, uh, is it met and is it as enforceable? The Clayton decision talks about a case where there was a, um, a Jewish clause was considered and the court found in that case that the clause was, it lacked certainty uh, for it to be enforceable. But an interesting obiter in the Clayton decision talks about the fact that the, the term, for example, the Christian faith is a term that is understandable to the courts and in the court, in the obiter, they go on to say, and so should the term Jewish faith be a term that is understandable to the court with certainty. It comes down to the clause itself, and as I, as I, well, I took you carefully through the clause, this case, we have certainty in respect of the condition. So, if, the, uh, if this is truly an interpretation case, then it, it helps us to look at some of the case law as well. The Peach Estate decision was a question of where it was a, a, a property that must be sold by the, it had to be the clause provided that the property must be sold to an Anglican or Presbyterian. And again, the court struggled with whether or not that was definitive enough. Is it simply too vague to say that? And therefore, is it uncertain? And therefore, is it unenforceable? Well, the court talks about the balancing act between the necessity of testamentary freedom and avoiding an intestacy and all of those uh, uh, considerations. But the court says this, although there may be circumstances where it is difficult to determine whether a person satisfies the definition, such difficulty should not prevent the giving, uh, not prevent giving uh, in effect, if possible, the testator's expressed intention. So we have this struggle, and it's a continuing struggle with every interpretation case, and that is, is that when we've got a testamentary freedom balanced against uh, an other element, and our other element in this case happens to be uh, public policy, but we don't have it balanced against uncertainty, and that is often the case when we're dealing with interpretations. The, so with, with, with respect to the Jewish clause, the Dobson estate tells us to go to the armchair rule, look at the plain meaning of the word, look at what Jewish faith is, is it an ascertainable term? I pointed to the decisions that say the Christian faith is an ascertainable term, ascertainable term, so should the Jewish clause uh, be ascertainable, the Jewish faith, the term itself. And the Dobson case says, as, as we always do in interpretations, look at the surrounding circumstances, which we've already heard about and uh, I don't want to uh, uh, delve into. So, so if it's a valid condition and it's enforceable, then what are we missing? Well, what we're missing here is, of course, the possibility that this is against public policy. And so are we to uphold Jewish clauses in the context of public policy? Well, in that regard, we have two strong uh, elements to the, uh, to the, the uh, unequivocal answer, and that, that yes, these clauses can be upheld. We've heard from the rabbi, he said it better than I can in terms of the, the balancing act with regard to the social public policy. But the, then let's start talking like lawyers again. Feinberg, the decision in Feinberg, it's a U.S. appellant court decision from Illinois where Justice Garman struggled with a case where uh, the parents had put that no grandchild who marries outside of the Jewish faith uh, will take. And in that decision, they, the, the appellant court upheld that clause and said that's a valid clause and that, that the testamentary freedom element of the clause outweighed what may be perceived to be uh, uh, somehow some tension with regard to the, and, and I think the court obviously uh, uh, struggled with this, was the overstating the discriminatory element of the of the uh, uh, of the clause. Then there's uh, the Baron Cauley decision, where the court argued that uh, where it was argued that using public policy to make a void condition based on religion would be wrong. It is it would it would bring about a substantial reduction of what is most important, and that is the firmly rooted uh, understanding in law that we have the right of testamentary freedom and testamentary disposition. 
My friends will focus on the Fox versus Fox decision, entirely distinguishable, not relevant in, these, in this case. And what that case was dealing with was an exercise of discretion that was set aside, the exercise of discretion was set aside as a result of the court finding malafides on, on the part of the fiduciary. So bad faith was undertaken on the part of the fiduciary. In this case, we're not talking about bad faith. And the courts talk about the struggle that it's not about one religion being better than the other religion. It is more about the enforceability of a condition that can be ascertained. And then finally, the key element to this argument uh, is, is what uh, the rabbi has, has articulated again better than I can. Survival is not an irrelevant factor here. Survival, this isn't, as I say, about one faith being better than the other faith. The Shapira decision from the U.S. New England courts talk about a case where you must, again, the, the individuals had to marry within the faith. There was a gift over in that case to the state of Israel, and the court found that clause, the Jewish clause, again, enforceable. But it, what they did was they focused on and demonstrated the testator's conviction as a result of his concern about the survival of the Jewish faith demonstrated in that case, of course, by the gift over. Because if his children did married out of the faith, the gift over provided that it would go to the state of Israel. So this testator, and the, and the decision was upheld, the Jewish clause was upheld in that sense because of that conviction. The data simply supports the survival motivation, A, and that the survival motivation in my submission is not something that can be underestimated in the context of the public policy arguments. Previous generations saw firsthand through the Holocaust how, uh, how important survival is with the Jewish faith. Well, this generation hasn't got that immediacy. And, and what's happening is from the data, and this is not my theory, these are the data from two learned articles by Gustav Goldman, Intermarriage Among Jews in Canada, and Gordon and Horowitz's article on Will Your, Will Your Grandchild Be Jews? And both of those articles point to the data, and that is, is that we are faced with a statistical likelihood of the Jewish faith being eliminated from a data standpoint alone. And that, in and of itself, brings out its other element of the survival argument and the importance of it. And in conclusion, what would we do without the Jewish faith? Well, we wouldn't have Albert Einstein. We wouldn't have Sigmund Freud. We wouldn't have Christopher Columbus, so I'm told by the internet. But most importantly, we wouldn't have meaningful assessment of, of what are relatively complex interpretation clauses, and that is, this is not something that the courts are afraid of. They've been interpreting clauses of this nature for 600 years. If there's a valid condition, if the condition can be met with certainty, that is the Jewish faith, and that it isn't against public policy for the reasons that I've said, then this clause must prevail out of the obligation of this court. Now you can listen to me. So. Thank you very much for taking your time, Your Eminence. I know that you probably fell asleep halfway through it, no doubt, but uh, I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Hall. <clears throat> I have a few questions. Me? Yes. My throat's sore. What do you want to know? Tell me about that Fox case. Um, <laughs> you lost it? that one, didn't you? Yeah. Yes. I take with great pride the many cases I have lost. And we do not have enough time for me to list them all. all right. But the um, Fox case, the interesting thing about the Fox case was yes. that moment when my father stood up and his panel was on, on the left side, eminent Jewish uh, judge, eminent Catholic judge, and in the middle, Justice uh, uh, McKinley, and, uh, and it was the Catholic that rode him over like a truck. <laughs> so we've, um, always, uh, we've always enjoyed that decision. So do you have any more questions? I don't have any more questions. I'll, <laughs> since you're my landlord, I don't have any other questions. <laughs> Thank you. I must confess that we did have ex-party discussions uh, on this case beforehand. So, Charlois, may I hear from you, please? Thank you, Your Honor. And, Your Honor, I will follow Mr. Hull's lead in speaking directly to the audience. That's fine. It's okay with you. I will be addressing Mr. Shapiro's claim for support from the deceased's estate under the Succession Law Reform Act. And under, in the notice of application, he specifically bases this claim 
on a moral obligation. It's the estate's position that Mr. Shapiro does not have a valid enforceable claim for support. He does not meet the threshold test under Section 57 of this SLRA in that he was not, the deceased was not providing him with support immediately prior to his death, nor was the deceased under a legal obligation to provide him with support immediately prior to his death. Absent meeting that threshold test, we do not get to the point where moral considerations come into play. The applicant cannot establish that he has a right to share in his father's estate based on the provisions of the Act. And the Ontario case law supports that view. There is no Ontario case that founds a right for an independent adult child to share in a parent's estate under the Succession Law Reform Act, and the case law surrounding this issue does not provide the basis for Mr. Shapiro succeeding here today. In the circumstances of this case, the deceased's testamentary freedom, an important public policy goal, must prevail. You've heard the facts. We've heard Mr. Shapiro uh, be cross-examined. He's sworn an affidavit. He's 29 years old. By his own admission, he is financially independent and self-sufficient. He enjoyed significant financial benefits during his lifetime at his father's hand. He went to private schools. He went to summer camps. His entire tuition at Columbia was paid for. His father gave him $250,000 to start his own business. Uh, but he is now at the point where he is successful, self-sufficient, and is in no need of any financial support from this estate. And, by his own admission, he was not being supported prior to death. Uh, yet he now asserts that he is entitled to a share of his father's estate under the support provisions of the SLRA. And that is notwithstanding his father's express, in, express intention and wishes to exclude him from his estate. And the starting point for the analysis is part five of the act. And that's the legislation under which Mr. Shapiro has to establish his right. Uh, in Mr. Hull's factum, I believe that's at tab 4B in the estate's factum, the provision that we need to look at is that Schedule B of the factum. And the starting point is Section 58 uh, of the Act, which says where a deceased, whether testate or intestate, has not made adequate provision for the proper support of his dependents or any of them, the court on application may order that such provision, may order such provision as it considers adequate be made out of the estate. We then have to go back to the definition of dependent, and this has already been spoken about and I've already referred to it. It does include a child of the deceased, but it has to be a child to whom the deceased was providing support or was under a legal obligation to provide support immediately before his or her death. The goal of the legislation is clearly to provide a remedy, a remedy to financial dependence of the deceased where inadequate provision has been made by the deceased in his will. It is not to found a basis for an independent child to claim what he or she thinks is his moral share of a deceased's estate. This section cannot permit a moral claim to trump the deceased's intention. If all children had a moral claim to a share of their parents' estate, then the section wouldn't be, wouldn't be defined as it is. The qualifying language at the end of the definition of dependent would be unnecessary if we all, as children, had moral claims to a share in our parents' estate. There would be no need to establish that the deceased is either providing support or under a legal obligation to provide support. We have to give meaning to the words in the statute. We have to give it the intention and the purpose it was designed to deal with. If the framework for support claims
framework for support claims is going to be altered as dramatically as now proposed by the applicant, that is not the role of the court. That is the role of the legislature. <clears throat> this, this testator has made a decision as to how he wishes to dispose of his estate, and absent legal dependency, that cannot be interfered with and should not be interfered with. While we may not like the result, we, while some of us may disagree with the end result of this case, it was the testator's prerogative to legally exclude his child from a share of his estate. And that child does not have any absolute right to share, absent meeting the test under the legislation. So then we have to look at the case law. It's been submitted that somehow the Ontario case law gives Mr. Shapiro the right he is now claiming he has. He takes the position that despite the clear wording, excuse me, <clears throat> of the statute, the case law establishes a right to support based on moral grounds. Um, I respectfully submit that there's no basis for that assertion. There's no case in Ontario in which a court has indicated there is such a right. Uh, the starting point for Mr. Shapiro's argu argument appears to be the Tattern case, the Supreme Court's decision based on the BC legislation. But that was based on a very different statute, a statute that does not require dependency in order for the court to intervene in a testator scheme of distribution. Rather, in BC, the court must determine whether adequate provision has been made for a spouse and children. That provided the court in BC, and therefore the Supreme Court, with much greater flexibility and discretion as to what was adequate, just, and equitable. But the case was decided in that context. Our legislation speaks of dependency. Dependency is a prerequisite to any entitlement under the section, and that has altered, not been altered by the case law and cannot have been altered by Tattern because it was based on a different statute. That brings us to the Cummings decision, which is the decision which is said to have moved in the direction of Tatarin. But the Cummings decision was a context between dependents. We had four individuals whose interests were considered. They were all dependents of the deceased. There was a wife, an ex-wife, and two dependent children. A son who suffered from a degenerative disease and a daughter who still had educational needs. There were no claims in Cummings being advanced by independent children. And in that case, None of the parties was advancing a claim based on moral grounds. The issue of whether a moral claim could found a support, under, a support order under the Act was in no way considered in Cummings. Rather, the court was considering, once dependency was established, whether moral considerations could come into play. And they can, but that is at the second stage of the analysis. Once you meet the prerequisite, in that you are a dependent of the deceased, the court then can balance many considerations, including moral considerations, in determining a proper allocation of the estate. And that becomes particularly important, whereas in many of these cases, the estate is of quite limited means, and there are competing interests and demands for the, for the funds left in the estate. And if we look at the court's decision in Cummings, it's clear that that is what is being done. And that case is at tab 5A of the brief. And at paragraph 34, the court says, the issue whether, and if so, to what extent moral or ethical considerations may be taken into account on a dependent's relief application in Ontario has not been dealt with at the appellate level. It goes on to say, in this case, the question is whether, in considering an application for relief on behalf of one or more dependent, the court may take into account not only the needs and means of those dependents, but also the moral obligations of the deceased person to another dependent who is not asserting a need. The answer to this question must be yes. So we are talking about a contest between dependents. We're not talking about assessing whether independent children have needs and whether there is any moral obligation to include them in a share of the deceased's estate. <clears throat> Paragraph 42, 
the court explicitly recognizes in saying, secondly, the beneficiaries, and this is a, about two thirds of the way, three, three quarters of the way down paragraph 42. Secondly, the beneficiaries of the British Columbia statute are not limited to dependent spouses and children, whereas that is the case in Ontario. So the court explicitly recognizes that our legislation is different, our legislation is limited to dependents, and that is not the case in BC. And again, at paragraph 50, when the court is examining the circumstances of an application for dependence relief, the court must consider, and at B, what moral obligations arise between the deceased and his or her dependents. So again, we are talking about moral considerations, no question, but it's in the context of moral considerations when we are looking at competing claims between defendants or among def dependents, sorry. Um, in, in an estate. So none of what I've talked to you about so far, neither of these two cases provide any basis for Mr. Shapiro's claim against this estate. Um, what Cummings is talking about is the flexibility that can be afforded to a court in terms of determining what is a proper allocation of a deceased estate. And it really looks at the shift from a needs-based analysis, which was historically what the court was looking at, to taking a broader, more flexible approach that allows the court to consider moral obligations. Nothing in Cummings permits Mr. Shapiro to sidestep the critical requirement under the legislation that he demonstrate dependency. Um, and really to suggest that Cummings does otherwise is to conflate the two-step test under the SLRA, which is one, are you a dependent? And two, at the second stage, if you are, what is the proper level of support to be awarded? It is only at the second stage that the moral considerations come into play. In his affidavit, Mr. Shapiro relies on Justice Henderson's decision in Pirelli and Foley. Um, I respectfully suggest that is misplaced again Pirelli was not a case in which the independent adult children were advancing claims under the SLRA. Rather, the deceased had left his estate to his independent adult children, and the estate was then faced with a claim by the common law spouse for both support and unjust enrichment. So it wasn't a case where the court was evaluating whether the children on moral grounds should share. It was a case of balancing the support claim by the spouse with the, the bequests in the will to the adult independent children. So that case, in my submission, doesn't help at all. The court was trying to figure out how much it should compromise the adult children's benefits under the will, which the deceased intended for them, with the spouse's legitimate claim both at common law and under the statute. So the court therefore naturally and properly considered moral, uh, co moral obligations and moral considerations in balancing these competing interests and determining what distribution was ultimately appropriate. This case did not in any way create a freestanding right for an independent child to advance a moral claim under the SLRA. <clears throat> so in summary, I think I'm running out of time, um, there is, in my respectful submission, no basis for Mr. Shapiro's claim. He cannot establish that he meets the test under the SLRA. He cannot establish that the case law has somehow fundamentally altered the test in the SLRA such that he is entitled to advance a moral claim to a share of his father's estate. There is absolutely no basis in this case to interfere with the deceased's testamentary intentions. The courts have repeatedly recognized the importance of those public policy considerations. And yes, in certain cases we do have to interfere and infringe upon a testator's right to dispose of his or her property as he sees fit, where there is legal dependency, but this is not one of those cases. 
And in this case, it is my re respectful submission that there's simply no basis to infringe upon the deceased's autonomy to dispose of the estate as he chose to do. And uh, those are my submissions, Your Honor. Thank you, Thank Michelle. You. Well, Subject to any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, I do have a few questions. Um, <clears throat> my, my first question is the question of what is meant by support in the SLRA. Um, the definition, it's, support is not defined in the SLRA. Why are council, why are you restricting it to financial support and money? Why, wh there are, there's case law that suggests that uh, support is a much broader uh, concept and broader than just financial support. Uh, the case law you refer to, I under, I, I've read and, I, and I've seen it. Um, I don't think it extends as broadly as will need to be submitted by my friend in terms of support to Mr. Shapiro. There's no question that when we are looking at whether he's entitled to a provision of his father's estate, we are talking financially. So, uh, sure, there's other types of support, but when we're talking about provision out of an estate, we are talking about financial. And this testator has supported his son throughout his lifetime. He's been very generous. And the question you ask, I, I suppose, is whether this support can take on a broader meaning in the context of the statute. Um, I don't think it goes so far as to say it entitles you to a share in an estate. I don't think the support concept can be stretched that far. I do not think that's what the statute was intended to provide. And as I said, if the legislation is going to go that far, I think that is a matter for the legislature, legislature because clearly support has connotations. And to the extent that we want to stretch it further that's in, than it's intended, I don't think that's our place. I think that is something that needs to be done more formally at the legislative level because the intention of the act, the clear intention when you look at how it was drafted was to provide for financial support for dependents who required that support from the deceased immediately prior to his or her death. That's an excellent answer. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thanks. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Wagner. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. I may just have a moment. My friends, Mr. Rabinowitz and Ms. Whaley, and I represent the applicant, Howard Shapiro. Just as a matter of housekeeping, Your Honor, may I confirm that you and all members of the audience have before them the application record that can be found at tab 4A. The expert report on tab 4C. And the case law and authorities on public policy, which can be found in tab 7A through E. Your Honor, my purpose before you today is to address the issue of public policy and whether the provision in the will, the Jew Clause, the Disinheritance Clause, is void on account of public policy. And if I may, Your Honor, as a thesis statement, so to speak, of my submissions before you today, I'd like to refer you to tab 7B. Coincidentally, that's the Fox Estate case that my friend Mr. Hull uh, appeared on, and particularly paragraph 18. This is obiter in the case, and while the facts of the Fox Estate case don't fall squarely on the facts before you today, Your Honor, it's worthwhile to read the obiter of the, of the judge. Paragraph 18. I am of the view that in this case, it would be contrary to public policy to permit a trustee effectively to disinherit the residual beneficiary because he dared to marry outside the religious faith of his mother. While there were decisions in the past which have upheld discriminatory conditions in wills, in response to a query from the bench, counsel in this case 
Ian, you were counsel in this case, right? Counsel in this case were not prepared to argue that any court today would uphold a condition in a will which provides that a beneficiary is to be disinherited if he or she marries outside of a particular religious faith. I find compelling Mr. Eastman's argument that if a, a testator could not do so, then his trustee could not do it for him. Your Honor, my submissions today is that provisions in wills that discriminate against people because of their religion are void for offending public policy. Before we look to public policy issues, Your Honor, I'd like to speak with you and the audience about certainty. Often when will provisions like this were brought before the court, there had to be some certainty before they would apply such a will provision and uphold it. If I may, Your Honor, I'd, I'd like to refer you to tab 8F at page 2, subsection E. The title of that uh, provision is Failure of Condition for Uncertainty. And this is from, I believe it's Waters on Trust, starting with Reed Borwick. In Reed Borwick, in 1933, Involves, involving possible restraint on freedom of religious allegiance, conditions requiring persons to be openly and avowedly Protestant or to confirm in the, uh, to the Church of England or not to many, marry any person not of Jewish parentage and of the Jewish faith have failed for uncertainty. Let's talk about why. In the four streams of Judaism, we can't agree on who is a Jew. The Reform says it's enough for the father to be a Jew. The Orthodox say it's enough for the mother to be a Jew. The Orthodox won't accept Reform or conservative conversions, and some rabbis will accept people such as the Falashas from Ethiopia as Jews, and others do not. Our fact situation is a little bit different, I grant you, Your Honor. In order to inherit, Howard Shapiro must marry a Jew in accordance with Orthodox law as determined by a rabbi of Sher Shemayim. But I submit to your honor, even that is uncertain. Even under Orthodox Jewish law, there's uncertainty as to who is a Jew. My friends will say, but the will has certainty because the clause has, says that the Orthodox rabbi from Sher Shemayim will make that decision. But even according to Orthodox law, sometimes there are doubts cast dispersions about Orthodox conversions. In Israel, for example, uh, uh, the rabbinate today is made up of a constituency in Orthodoxy called Haredi Jews. Just like some Orthodox uh, Jewish courts do not accept conservative conversions, some Haredi Jewish courts don't accept modern Orthodox conversions. And, Your Honor, it's not my role or not my purpose to cast aspersions on any of these individual camps or the integrity of their decision-making process. It's just not so certain. And, Your Honor, even if certainty is not a problem, I submit that the disinheritance clause offends public policy because these clauses are racist. I, turn, I refer you to tab 8F, page 7, at the bottom of the page, number 6. Are you there, Your Honor? I am. It refers to a case that stands for the proposition that conditions intended or tending to discriminate racial, racially are void, <clears throat> even if they pass the test of certainty. Let's talk about the case, Your Honor, of Midland versus Hirschman. Testator had left his property to a daughter. There was a condition. She wasn't allowed to marry a Jew. But the daughter did marry a Jew, and she challenged the cause. 
McInnes J. held that the language to constitute malum prohibitum, and that the condition being precedent, it was just merely struck out. But the judge made some important com comments, which I submit to you are relevant to the case of the bar. Any propensity towards racial discrimination has no place in this country, and while it may be open to a testator to lay down the conditions upon which his children may or may not share in his bounty, yet insofar as those conditions involve racial discrimination, his language must be precise, and explicit and clearly within the law if he expects the court to assist him in the fulfillment of his aims. Your Honor, if I may, I'd, <clears throat> I'd like to refer you to tab 8F where Professor Waters refers to a decision of Tarnopolsky J in Canada Trust Company versus the Ontario Human Rights Commission. There was a foundation set up. It was called the Leonard Foundation Trust and it was set up to provide scholarships restricted to Christian students of the white race. If the trust, <clears throat> in this case, Your Honor, the trust was found to be void on the basis that it violated public policy. Your Honor, I invite my friends, representing the estate trustee, to argue that either of these two decisions were wrong, or that they can be distinguished. I submit to you that these cases were correct, and they can't be distinguished. <coughs> well, let me ask you a question then about the Leonard case. Um, the Leonard case, in, the, in that trust that was established, specifically talked about the predominance of the white race. That was a fundamental part of the recital in the Leonard case. Yes, Your Honor. Um, that doesn't exist in this one. We don't have that. We have instead an encouragement to marry within a faith. Your Honor, it's a, a distinction, the width of a hair's breadth. <clears throat> there are those who might argue in a free and democratic society that it is no less praiseworthy to keep the white race any more than it is to keep the Jewish faith. We may in this room disagree, but in a free and democratic society, they will make that argument. And the distinctions we make, Your Honor, in these case, cases are so narrow that the message is lost and there has to be a prioritization uh, a premium of premium values that we cherish as Canadians. The decisions that came earlier on that allowed these types of discriminatory clauses came before the human rights legislation. It came before the Charter of Rights and Freedom, which reflect an evolution of the graying of Canadian society. My friends will not argue that these cases, the Leonard case, the Hirschman case, they won't argue that they're proper. And Your Honor, if we allow a Jew to discriminate against a Gentile today, what is to stop us from allowing Gentiles to discriminate against Jews tomorrow? As a matter of fact, in the affidavit, we recall uh, the, the affiant, the applicant, recalls a horrible time in Canadian history where it was normal to have restaurants that say, no Jews or dogs allowed. We were in a society where we didn't, where Canada didn't allow Holocaust survivors to gain entry because as the phrase of the learned professor, Irving Abella said, none was too many. To stop all discrimination, we have to stop all discrimination. If we go down this road, Your Honor, and because we can finesse the distinction, 
Will the court permit trusts for universities for athletic scholarships only to white people to promote white athletes because there aren't enough white athletes in the NBA? Will the court permit properties only to be sold to English-speaking individuals so as to promote English? The list goes on, Your Honor, and it's my humble submission to you that this is a very dangerous, slippery slope. Your Honor, one of the authorities I enjoy most is Feeney's Canadian Law of Wills. And if I may refer you to tab 8H, paragraph 16.60 in your tab, in your materials. The learned author makes an interesting argument. He suggests <clears throat> that section 7 of the Charter of Rights guarantees life, liberty, and the security of person. He then suggests that section 15 guarantees equality before and under the law and equal protection and benefit of the law. The author suggests that the right, the enshrinement of the right to security of person may also include the right to property. Now my friends may ask, the charter deals with government. Here we're doing, dealing with a private concern. But as, as we all know who are in this profession, there are many things that flow not from the authority to an executor in the will, but from the grant of a certificate of appointment, probate. The government, in essence, is a partner in the probate process. And if the government of Ontario is participating in the probate process, that in so doing, it, it, any of its acts have to comply with the Charter. Your Honor, those are my short submissions safe for this. My friends brought up that this application is attack on testamentary freedom. To quote the Latin phrase that Lord Denning often used, bubamysis, Your Honor, bubamysis. Today in Ontario, no one really believes in the absolute right of testamentary freedom. When there's breach of public policy, it is an appropriate instance for those rights to be circumscribed. Our courts introduced the concepts of constructive trust to prevent what we considered inappropriate testamentary freedom the exclusion of a spouse, the exclusion of children who were dependent financially and emotionally on a parent. The Family Law Act was instituted where our legislature came about and said, sorry sir, you can't cut out your spouse. She has a right to uh, division of net family property. The Succession Law Reform Act says, excuse me, sir, you have obligations. You have to support your spouse. You're dependent. My friend Ms. Whaley will speak more about the Succession Law Reform Act, but let's recognize that the right of testamentary freedom is not absolute. Just like we can't yell fire and have everybody rush for those exits, we can't have absolute freedom. And that's certainly recognized in many parts of the world. In Europe, there are forced airship laws. In British Columbia, they, they provide for, again, I would suggest to you on the foundation of public policy concerns, a moral obligation to the children. And if I may, Your Honor, in rendering your decision, both in when you do so orally and in your written uh, decision. Yeah, I'll, you may have to wait for that one. Yeah. You have a reputation for that, Your Honor. I'd ask that you comment on professional ethics and liability in this situation. What I mean, Your Honor, 
is that we have six senior lawyers here today. That's costing this estate cumulatively $4,000 an hour, at least. And I'm not even including Howard's bill. So now we're at 8000 I was not going to say so, Your Honor. Who is paying that cost? The estate? If the court finds that this disinherited clause violates public policy, I ask Your Honor to comment on the responsibility, both professionally, ethically, and legally, of the lawyer who drafted the will. Clearly, he must have recognized the red flags. The way he drafted that will, the way he tried to tighten it up, the way he was defined in the, he, he wanted to eliminate the element of uncertainty. Didn't the lawyer have a professional and ethical responsibility not to draft a will that violated public policy? Shouldn't he pay for that mistake? Why should he pay for that mistake? Could you please stop pounding the table? Thank you. <laughs> Get your a hold of your client. Your Honor, <clears throat> the last case I'd like to refer to can be found at tab 70. It's Klein versus Klein. Unlike the cases my re friend referred to, the American cases, I'd like to refer to a Canadian case. This is a fact scenario. Parents were Orthodox Jews. The mother made a will which provided, one, should any of my children marry out of the Jewish faith, the share of the said child or the balance unpaid thereof as of the time of the said marriage shall devolve to my other children or child as the case may be, the issue of the latter to take place of the deceased parent. So what did the good Jewish daughter do? She married a nice Catholic boy. Thereafter, she converted to Catholicism. The daughter challenged the will. <clears throat> now, Your Honor, I will see to you and to my friends that Quebec's law is somewhat different. Ontario is based on the common law. Quebec is based on the civil law. But what is the harmony in this case is that Quebec had a Freedom of Worship Act, preserving the freedoms that we do in Ontario today, both in our human rights legislation and in our Charter of Rights. And the court found, and I refer you to page five, that if a condition puts a legatee in the alternative of having to make his religion conform to the wishes of the testator, in order to benefit from a legacy, the condition restricts the freedom of religion and is therefore contrary to public order and good morals. Your Honor, <clears throat> this case is not whether continuity of the Jewish people is a worthy goal. It certainly is. It is about two competing values, Your Honor. It's about the propriety of imposing restrictions on people in a free and democratic society. In Canada, we are free to marry whomsoever we desire. In Canada, people are free to practice their religion as they so desire, without government interference and without parental interference. It is appropriate to enforce a provision in a will that doesn't violate those principles. I submit to you, it is inappropriate to enforce a provision of will that tries to coerce religious observance, that partially restrains a person's right to marry. Your Honor, in my submission, any racial or religious discrimination of any kind is against public policy. I submit that we cannot righteously condemn and set aside provisions promoting the white race and discriminating against non-whites, but at the same time enforce provisions supporting Jewish continuity. Essentially, we would be standing up and sitting down at the same time.
and we just can't do that. You're right. I can't do both. Subject to any questions, Your Honor, those are all my submissions. I have one question. If Mr. Shapiro had told his, his lawyer in confidence, I want to cut out Howard because he is married a non-Jewish person and therefore cut him out, left it all to his sister. Does the court have the right to look behind the terms of the will for the motive? Your Honor, my friend Ms. Whaley will be speaking directly to that point. Great. And she will do so because it is not an issue of public policy. It is an issue whether the moral obligation of a parent to share his bounty with his children constitutes a legal obligation. But I, but I guess my point is this. Can I not discriminate as a testator and just not say anything? I mean, do, should the court be involved in getting behind the rationale of testators for making a bequest? Your Honor, with respect, as I am understanding your question, it doesn't make sense to me. It's as if asking, is it okay to steal as long as I don't get caught? That's not before the court today. Before the court today is, a person is discriminating against a son for marrying outside the faith. It's in clear eyes for everybody to see. It may be that if he didn't get caught and you camouflaged the reasons behind it, that it will wouldn't be challenged. But that has no impact on the matter today before you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Whaley. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Your Honor, my friend Mr. Wagner has just made the argument that the disinheritance clause is void on public policy grounds, and I concur with the position taken by my friend. If, however, you're not minded to agree with this position, then the alternative argument that I'm submitting on behalf of Howard today is that he qualifies as a dependent under Part 5 of the Succession Law Reform Act, and he is therefore entitled to an award of support in spite of the clause in the will disinheriting Howard for marrying outside of the Jewish faith. And in spite of my friend Ms. Charlebois's argument, I will be highlighting a few pointed arguments from my factum, Your Honor. It's, it's my submission that Howard is a dependent of his father, and moreover, that his father had a solid legal and moral obligation to provide a proper share of his estate for Howard. My further submission is that the deceased did have a moral obligation both to provide a share of his wealth to his son regardless of need and to morally support him and his moral obligation translates into a legal obligation now that our provincial case law has developed to support this contention. Morally, the deceased was obliged to support Howard, including his choice of spouse, and the deceased should not be, in, now in his will and in his death, permitted to abdicate this moral responsibility. It is clear that as a result of the disinheritance clause that the deceased did not make adequate provision for Howard, since half of the residue of the estate will now pass to his sister Janet. Your Honor, I rely on Section 58 of the Act, which states, where a deceased has not made adequate provision for the proper support of his dependents, the court on application may order that such provision as it considers adequate be made out of the estate of the deceased for the proper support of his dependents. And further, Your Honor, I also rely on Section 57 of the Act, where the definition of dependent includes child. A child of the deceased to whom the deceased was providing support immediately prior to death or was an, uh, under a legal obligation to support. Importantly, Your Honor, the Act does not limit the definition of child to a minor child, and nor does it limit the definition to financially dependent children. And as such, there is no question, Your Honor, that Howard meets the first part of the test. As to the second part of the test in Section 58, the right of an adult child who is receiving support immediately prior to death, 
to receive support after death has been clearly established in Ontario. The deceased did provide Howard with support and over the course of a long lifetime, immediacy irrelevant. Howard deposes and his cross confirms, notwithstanding Mr. Van Der Zee's failed attempts to discredit my client, Your Honor, that his father did his best to provide he and his sister with every luxury he could afford. Howard went to private schools, he went to summer camps, he traveled the world all on dad's account. Howard graduated, he went to Columbia University in New York, and the deceased supported him. He paid for the, the, legal educa or the education that Howard received. And the, ex the tuition was very expensive. And he gave Howard money so that he didn't have to have summer jobs or employment during the course of his studies. The deceased assisted Howard by giving him $250,000 at the time he was setting up his business. Notably, Your Honor, support has not been limited to financial support in our Ontario case law, and nor in the factors enumerated under Section 62 of the Succession Law Reform Act, which, by the way, since the inception of that legislation, has provided as criterion a moral obligation. The cases of Davies and Davies and Cummings support the contention that support may also be, include physical and moral support. The right of an adult child who is not receiving support immediately prior to a parent's death until the Supreme Court of Canada case in BC, the case of Tatarin, was less certain. But now, according to the court, two interests need to be protected. The first, Your Honor, those of spouses and children and ensuring that they receive adequate, just, and equitable provision and equitable division of the family wealth, even in the absence of demonstrated need. And the second interest to be protected is testamentary autonomy, which I'll touch further on in, in a minute, Your Honor, you having asked the question of my friend, Mr. Wagner. In determining and reviewing the two interests, the court held that there must be an examination of the legal and moral obligation owed, by the, owed to the children. With respect to moral obligation, the court looked at obligations owing to independent children specifically, and importantly stated, while the moral claim of independent adult children may be more tenuous, a large body of case law exists suggesting that if the size of the estate permits and in the absence of circumstances which negate the existence of such an ob obligation, some provision for such children should be made. And where the estate permits, all claims should be met, the court said. And though noting that the legal claims should generally take place over moral claims, this distinction is important, emphasizing a separate moral claim exists, therefore making it a legal claim. As a result of this seminal case, we have seen our provincial courts increasingly choosing to interpret our dependence relief legislation in such a way so as to attribute a greater moral weight, a greater weight to the moral considerations. And Ontario is no different. In Cummings and Cummings in 2004, the finding upheld by our Court of Appeal, where it declared that the principles of Tatarin applied in Ontario, and that's in spite of the differences between the legislation. In fact, the Court of Appeal went so far as to hold that a moral obligation is owed to the spouse and children on death, and with respect to claims made by adult independent children, the court held that the dependence relief legislation was not only to provide for need, but was also to ensure that spouses and children receive a fair share of family wealth. Notably, our court stated at paragraph 20, Your Honor, referring to Tatarin at paragraph 40, a deceased moral duty toward his dependents is a relevant consideration on a dependence relief application, and judges are not limited to conducting a needs-based economic analysis in determining which disposition to make. In doing so, the court rejected the argument that the judicious father and husband test should be replaced with a needs-based test. Essentially, the upshot of Cummings, Your Honor, is that it brought Tatarin fairly and squarely to Ontario, clarifying that both moral and legal obligations must be considered and even independent children are entitled to proper support and a fair division of a parent's assets after death. The Court of Appeal held that in determining support, the courts are to use their discretion to both identify and prioritize claims and that where the estate is sufficient, all claims ought to be met. The court has afforded broad discretion in applying equitable relief. 
There has been further case law since coming supporting this position that adult independent children like Howard and Janet ought to receive a fair share of family wealth. For instance, I draw your honor's attention to the case of Broderick and Papathanasu. This is a 2006 case in Ontario and the court applying Cummings confirmed that whether or not the applicant was a dependent of the deceased should not be determined solely on a needs-based analysis. In making its decision, the court balanced both the legal and the moral obligations owed to the deceased, sorry, owed by the deceased to his children, and in this case his adult daughters, to enjoy the benefit of their father's estate. And the case of Pirelli and Foley estate, which provides support for the position that a moral obligation equates to a common law legal obligation. In that case, applying Cummings, the court concluded that the court must do more than conduct a simple needs-based analysis and determine the issue of proper support, and the court should apply the judicial father and husband test in determining the appropriate disposition. The court citing Cummings and Tatarin for the proposition that the deceased's moral duty towards his dependents is a relevant consideration. And the Ontario Court of Appeal confirmed that one of the objectives of the act was to ensure that spouses and children, again, receive a fair share of family wealth. The court did state it must consider the intentions of the deceased so as to protect testamentary autonomy. And I understand this is a concern of your honors, having my, asked my friend, Mr. Wagner. In this case, for reasons submitted by my friend, Mr. Wagner, the autonomy of the testator was exercised unreasonably and without regard to his moral obligations. The court also noted that in a claim under Section 58 of the Act, it, is, it must first identify all of the dependents and quantify and prioritize the claims and to also identify those non-dependents who may have a legal or moral share, uh, claim to a share of the estate. And then to balance those competing claims by taking into account the size of the estate, the strength of the claims, and the intentions of the deceased in order to arrive at a judicious distribution. The court found that the deceased clearly had a moral obligation in Pirelli to provide the bequest he did to his adult children and to provide for his spouse. And one other case, Your Honor, I'm not sure if you've, you've, anyone has addressed this today, was a case of Salmon and Stabler. And it's a BC case from year, the year 2000, where an applicant who was one of six independent adult children had been disinherited. The parties were all on an equal footing. The plaintiff's conduct towards his mother while she was alive did not disentitle him to a share of the estate. And the court ordered that he share equally in the estate of his late mother. So to conclude, Your Honor, there's little doubt that as a result of Cummings, Tatarin has come to Ontario. Indeed, the deceased had a legal and binding moral obligation to provide a proper share of his estate to his adult children, even though self-sustaining adults like Janet and Howard. Applied to the facts before us, there are no circumstances, Your Honor, negating the obligation to provide for Howard, Although Howard did not adopt his father and his sister's new way of life, their family relationship continued. It did not change. They still loved each other. The deceased and Howard had only argued once in their entire lives. The estate is a large one. It's over a million dollars. The only other dependent is Howard's sister, and her interest, too, is a moral one. She's not in financial need. The legislation permits, Your Honor, wide discretion to make adequate provision for Howard. Howard ought to be entitled to an equal share of his father's estate. It's my submission, Your Honor, that adequate provision in these circumstances should see the family's wealth distributed evenly as between Howard and his sister. That said, Your Honor, Howard, being a generous man like his father, would be content for the charity, B'nai B'rith, to receive its legal cost and a charitable donation from the estate or alternatively from Howard and Janet equally from their respective shares and the total amount of $100,000. Your Honor, those are my submissions subject to any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Whaley. <clears throat> I would have preferred a donation, I think, to the judge's pension plan, but <laughs> that's fine. Are you saying to me, Ms. Whaley, that I am in a better position to determine what is fair and reasonable than Howard's father, than the deceased? Isn't that the position that you're putting this court in, that I am now the one who has to decide what is morally 
the right amount when the testator, if we have any testamentary freedom, isn't that their choice? Aren't they in the best position to make that decision? Well, Your Honor, the testator is no longer with us, unfortunately. And uh, because... I find that in many of these cases. <laughs> It's a shame, really. It would make my job so much easier. But anyway. And unfortunately, Howard is left in the position of having to, at great expense, come to your honor and ask you to assess all of the facts and exercise your discretion, discretion as you have to, to make an equitable uh, and adequate uh, award of support to him. But hasn't the testator considered all those moral obligations? Why am I second-guessing the testator? I'm not sure that he had good counsel when he did his will, Your Honor. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Whaley. You're welcome, Your Honor. Thank you all, uh, counsel. Does anybody make, want to make submissions on costs, or should I just reserve? I think I'll reserve the issue of costs, and I'll reserve my decision for 10 minutes. We'll return, and I'll deliver my uh, judgment. Thank you.